Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back from the break. So right now, we'll start the second session on brain encoding. Great. Let's see if we can do a full screen here. Perfect. Great. Great, so uh, welcome back. So in this part of the uh, tutorial, I'll be discussing brain encoding, so deep learning for brain encoding. And specifically, we'll talk about uh, three different parts. So first, I, I will go over some classic findings with encoding models that used stimulus representations that were not from deep learning. So these stimulus representations uh, tried to encode some kind of hypothesis for uh, what the uh, relevant so, sorry for the interruption are that uh, should affect the brain activity. Hello. Uh, uh, and in the second part, uh, I will talk about uh, some common approaches to fit these encoding models uh, and how to actually evaluate uh, the similarity between these stimulus representations that we have chosen and the actual brain activity uh, that we care about. Uh, and uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that so I'm presenting in person right now and. Uh, I know that there might be some questions on the chat, so please feel free to leave the questions there. Uh, Suba will uh, will check them and will he will ask the questions for you. Um, so just yeah, I wanted to let you know about that. Great. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hello. Okay. Well, people in the room. Great. So. Can you hear me? In general, in cognitive uh, science, uh, we want yes, yes, to I reach can. some kind of mechanistic uh, understanding it's fine, right? of how information is processed in the brain. And in order to do that, uh, there are really four big questions that we need to answer uh, about what information is processed where and when in the brain and how this information is aggregated together. So encoding models can help with some of these questions, and we'll see in this part of the tutorial uh, some examples of uh, using encoding models to answer especially the, the what, when, and where questions. So encoding models are nice because uh, they have what we call a causal interpretation. So uh, an encoding model predicts the brain activity as a function of some representation of the stimulus that corresponds to a specific hypothesis. So for example, if we take this um, stimulus that we're going to work with in a hands-on session, which is fMRI recordings of people viewing um, the movie Hidden Figures, which has both the visual and the auditory stimulation as inputs. Uh, we, let's say we want to investigate how does the stimulus affect a specific brain area in the brain. So let's say that we have a hypothesis that the part of speech um, of spe specific words actually affects the brain activity. So we can evaluate that hypothesis by building a representation of the part of speech. Uh, so let's say we, are, um, we can represent orbit with a one-hot vector with one corresponding to a noun, because orbit is a noun, and zeros for everything, all other types of part of speech. And this stimulus representation, this part of speech stimulus representation, is a hypothesis for what kind of stimulus properties we think are affecting the brain activity. But these stimulus properties are, of course, latent, so we don't know them, right? So this is a way to try to uh, understand what these stimulus properties are. And the stimulus representation that we have chosen, if it's a good one, has some overlap in variance with these actual latent stimulus properties. But of course, uh, the stimulus representation will not be perfect, so we won't be able to encode all stimulus properties that are relevant to the brain with this hypothesis that we have chosen. So once we have chosen this hypothesis, we now can tr finally train an encoding model that predicts this brain area as a function of the stimulus representation. And we evaluate it uh, on data that we haven't seen before. So I'm going to go into details about exactly how we do this. I just wanted to give you a, a high level picture of what the encoding model approach is trying to do. So uh, under some assumptions, uh, we, we know from previous work that uh, these encoding models can reveal which brain areas are affected by the stimulus properties 
that are encoded by the specific stimulus representation. And these assumptions are that the stimulus are chosen by the experimenter and that they precede the brain measurements. Uh, and also that the activity that we predict using this encoding model is not related to some external factors or artifacts that are correlated with the stimulus. So under these assumptions, encoding models can be causally interpreted uh, right, to reveal which brain areas are affected by these stimulus properties. So I wanted to uh, share with you a few classic findings uh, using encoding models that make specific hypotheses for what these stimulus properties that are brain relevant are. Uh, and so I'm going to split these into three categories. One is language, uh, and this work will be, uh, they're all sort of older works. So this work is from Tom Mitchell and, and colleagues from 2008. In Vision, we have a work from Kendrick Kay and colleagues uh, in 2008 as well. And in audio, we have a work from Roberta Santoro and colleagues uh, for a little bit more recent. So for the language work uh, by Tom Mitchell and colleagues, um, we, so Manish actually in his presentation touched on um, this work a little bit. So here what these authors used were uh, actual concrete nouns for the stimulus uh, and in addition to line drawings of these concrete nouns. So they presented these stimuli to people in an fMRI and they recorded their brain activity. So the stimulus representation that the authors chose was a co-occurrence of these uh, specific nouns with 25 sensory motor verbs, and such as see, hear, taste, and smell. So the hypothesis here comes from what is known as the embodied cognition hypothesis, which is that the representation of a concept in the brain is represented in a distributed and yet organized way, um, in such a way that the uh, semantic attributes are represented by the specific um, areas of the brain that underlie the sensory perception of these properties. And so there is empirical evidence for this hypothesis um, in all these modalities, so addition, color, shape, motion, and olfaction. So the authors created this co-occurrence with these 25 sensory motor verbs um, and predicted the fMRI recordings as a function of these co-occurrence statistics. And so they found, uh, so they created these encoding models. Again, I'll go over exactly how to do this, but I wanted to give you, um, to motivate the use of encoding models here. Uh, so what they did was they uh, learned these weights that map these co statistics to the fMRI recordings. And once we have learned this mapping, we can now apply it to any um, new word. So we can, let's say, choose telephone, uh, which is not presented um, to the model during training and we can apply the learned weights and we can predict some fMRI recordings, uh, what we think the fMRI recordings would be given that we presented telephone to the subject. And what the, these authors showed was that they can actually accurately predict the fMRI recordings for a novel word that was not presented during uh, this, this, the training of this model of the weights here. But what's even more interesting is that what they showed is a correspondence between a semantic property, so one of these uh, 25 uh, verbs that was in the core occurrence uh, statistics, uh, and the function of the cort cortical region where the fMRI recordings were well predicted. Uh, so this is additional evidence um, or in support for this embodied cognition hypothesis. Now the second work uh, by Kendrick Kay and colleagues uh, is now in vision, so here this is a very classic work, and Manish also discussed that briefly. Uh, so here the authors presented natural images to uh, people in fMRI uh, who are passively viewing these images. So here the representations that the authors chose was a mixture of Gabor wavelets. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, a Gabor wavelet pyramid or mixtures of Gabor wavelets have been long regarded as the standard model for how the primary visual cortex, or V1, represents shape. Uh, so these authors uh, chose this Gabor wave rep representation uh, as a hypothesis for how V1 uh, is representing these images. 
and they use encoding models to estimate quantitative receptive fields for each voxel in the fMRI recordings. So once they estimated these uh, receptive fields, they're able to actually use them to uh, estimate what the fMRI recording would be to novel images. So they're actually able to use these uh, to select which of set of candidate natural images a participant was viewing. So they're able to use it in a decoding uh, framework where they can basically understand what image somebody was viewing. And then the last work here in the classic encoding work from Roberto Santoro and colleagues. So they actually looked at natural sounds. So this included speech and music and uh, some nature sounds as well as sounds from tools and animals. Uh, and what they chose was a spectrotemporal uh, representation of these uh, audio sounds uh, that were selected for modulations along um, either space or time or both space and time. And this is fMRI recordings of people listening to these sounds. Uh, so the authors chose representations from several different computational models that implemented different hypotheses uh, for these modulations along space and time. Uh, and so what they found was uh, something very interesting, uh, which is that the posterior auditory cortices uh, seem to prefer coarse spectral information at high temporal precision, whereas interior uh, and ventral auditory cortices preferred fine-grained spectral information at low temporal precision. So these are all three of these works um, are well regarded and, um, of course, are very important. Um, but as we move towards kind of a new era in neuroscience where we use naturalistic um, stimuli, <laughs> such as text from books or discourse uh, or even viewing movies, uh, we actually become to have more stimulus properties that affect the brain activity. So this variance uh, in the stimulus properties that's important for the brain activity uh, is expanding. So this stimulus representations that are simple, like simple hypotheses for the stimulus representation, actually become to explain less and less variance in, in brain activity measurements. And so on the other hand, we have these huge progress in deep learning in the last 10 years, uh, which really gives us AI models that can do many different tasks. Um, and of course, these are not perfect and are sometimes even flawed uh, but there's the question of whether we can use these internal representations in the models uh, that they have built of the world as rich stimulus representations that perhaps capture some of these properties uh, that the brain also cares about in the naturalistic um, stimuli. So here's when encoding models, um, data-driven encoding models can be very helpful. So these data-driven models can be used to evaluate this relationship between internal representations in uh, deep learning models and in representations in the brain. And so what, this is a standard, uh, I mean, uh, obviously schematic of a standard encoding model uh, pipeline. So here we have the same stimulus, uh, which is, let's say, a multimodal stimulus from a naturalistic viewing of a movie. Uh, and we present the same stimulus to a person in an fMRI machine. Uh, and we also present the same stimulus as input to a deep learning model. And then we can extract representations, internal representations of this model that the model has built uh, in order to uh, solve some kind of task. Um, and we can also look at the representations in the brain in specific regions uh, that we're interested in understanding better. And then we can ask how are these two representations of the same stimulus, one from the machine and one from the brain, related? So we use an encoding model for this. And this encoding model takes as input this um, representation, internal representation from the model of the stimulus and predicts as output a specific activity in a specific region of the brain or a center um, time point if we're using um, imaging device with high temporal resolution. So this function f uh, can be modeled in different ways and one very um, popular way to model it is a linear function. So learning linear weights that map the input representations to the output brain activity. Uh, but of course, people have looked into uh, 
what does this mean? Uh, why do we model this as a linear function? Can we use a nonlinear function f? Uh, and this, this was uh, mo most recently done by Anna Ivanova and her colleagues uh, in a January adversarial collaboration at the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference. Uh, and they have a really nice preprint uh, on this that summarizes the choice of mapping models in the context of three desiderata. So predictive accuracy, interpretability, and biological plausibility. And what's really interesting is that they found that uh, the choice of linear versus nonlinear model doesn't really map very cleanly, cleanly along this three desiderata. Uh, so their takeaway is that uh, we need to choose specific mapping models in terms of their complexity for the specific research question that uh, we care about. So I encourage you to check out this paper if you're interested in this um, difference between the linear and nonlinear models. And so once we have chosen the parameterization for this function f, uh, we want to learn the parameters of the function or the weights uh, from our actual data, right? So we do this in a cross-validated way, uh, which is standard machine learning technique, and we often regularize this learning uh, via some kind of uh, regularization parameter. And again, I'll discuss more specifics in just a few slides. And once we have trained the model, uh, we want to actually evaluate this relationship between uh, the internal representations of the model and the brain. So we do this in three ways. The first one is to make predictions for data that we haven't seen during training. Of, of course, this is a standard machine learning um, technique. And the second one is that uh, once we have made predictions for this held out data, we want to actually see how similar are these predictions to uh, the true brain data. So uh, we have different evaluation metrics, which can tell us the similarity between the two. And then the third one, which is very important, is that we do stringent statistical testing in order to understand whether the similarity measure that we got uh, in the second part is actually significant, or this relationship that we evaluated could have been due to chance. So let's get started with this training setup. So, so here, our goal, again, is to find a mapping from the stimulus representation to brain data that, uh, in order to generalize to new brain data that we haven't seen before. And so this method uh, is to split the data set. This is very important. Split the data set into three different data sets. So we have a trained data set, validation data set, and a test data set. And we're going to employ cross-validation to actually select the model parameters or the weights in this model uh, based on this validation set um, th that we have. So we, we select, um, right, so we also want to reduce the overfitting because many times uh, we don't have that much brain data that we use to fit this encoding model. Uh, so uh, it's important to use regularization, uh, which is a technique for machine learning to avoid overfitting. And uh, a very popular type of regularization is ridge regularization, which um, pushes the weights for unimportant features uh, to be very small, but it does not, um, it handles correlated features very well as well. Great, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out here is that um, you may be wondering how do we handle uh, the output of the model? So do we predict the entire brain at the same time? Uh, how do we actually do this encoding model uh, prediction? So uh, a very popular approach here is to actually train an independent model for each participant in the study. Uh, and some advanced models recently have uh, started to use information from all participants, uh, but this is a more standard approach here. So to train an independent fu function f, so here we would have f1 for subject one, f2 for subject two, and so on. And another important uh, thing to note here is that we often train an independent model for each different location in the brain uh, or for each different sensor time point. And one more thing to note in the training here for uh, specifically for fMRI, um, and here I'm going to use a figure from uh, Shaley Jane's work with her colleagues because I thought it was a very nice illustration of this method that many of, you, many of us use in encoding for fMRI specifically. And here the, the, the issue with fMRI is that, um, I think Manish touched on this a little bit, uh, is that um, the, the, the actual signal that fMRI measures is delayed 
Um, and we need to account for that in the prediction because a signal, an, an fMRI recording at a particular time will be a function of several, uh, several different stimuli that we have chosen uh, in the previous 10 to 12 seconds, depending on how often we take an fMRI image. And so there's a few steps that, uh, yeah, I should go with this. There's a few steps here, uh, just two additional steps uh, to do this encoding pipeline for fMRI specifically. So here, again, the goal is to, um, and here I'm illustrating this with language. So the goal here is to predict the fMRI recordings that correspond to a specific sentence uh, or paragraph that the person read. So here for each paragraph, we extract the representations for each word in the paragraph, uh, which we can see here. So each different uh, row corresponds to the representation for the specific word. Uh, so here we have about uh, 2,000 words, and then each word is represented by about 1,000 dimensions. So these representations can be obtained from a neural network model of, of language, so the internal representations of this model, for example. Uh, and so these words uh, were presented for, uh, let's say, 500 milliseconds, uh, but the fMRI image uh, is taken every two seconds, let's say, or sometimes can be every one second or 1.5 seconds. So we need to account for this. This is the first step of, of creating TR level features or image level features for the fMRI. So the first step is to downsample this word level representations into a TR level representations. And there are several ways to do that. Um, if the, the, the words were presented for a fixed amount of time, for the same amount of time, we can simply average uh, the representations within a specific TR that correspond to the words within a specific TR. Uh, but there's more advanced methods to downsample uh, if the words were presented for um, non-equal amount of time. And I believe we'll go through that in the hands-on. And then the last step for fMRI is to uh, account for this delayed response. Uh, so one way to do this is to convolve these TR features uh, with a, a canonical HRF function, uh, which looks kind of like this, and uh, is able to give us sort of a, um, a better estimate of what these features should be f that correspond to the brain activity from fMRI. But doing that would assume a specific canonical, this canonical HRF for all voxels in the brain. But we know from, from neuroscience work that that's not necessarily the case. It's not necessar ne necessary that all voxels in the brain have the same uh, hemodynamic response. And so what's a more data-driven approach that a lot of us in, in this area use is to actually let the model learn this HRF function on its own. So in order to do that, we stack, uh, we concatenate several uh, TR level representations from previous TRs, and we allow the model to learn the weights, how to weigh these different TRs on its own, uh, given the brain signal. And then once we have stacked these representations, we train a linear regression model regularized with ridge penalty, or in other words, ridge regression, to actually obtain um, this final weights of the model that we can then apply to new unobserved data. Okay, are there any questions for this uh, training part or up to here? Okay. So once we have trained these parameters, we move on to actually evaluating them on data that we haven't seen during training. Uh, so of course, to do this, we want to predict held out data uh, by applying this learn function to corresponding stimulus representations. And we compare the predictions of this brain data to true uh, brain data. And uh, for this, we have several evaluation metrics and the most popular two uh, I've shown here, so the left one I would say is the most popular, which is a simple Pearson correlation. Uh, so this is for each voxel, let's say an fMRI, uh, you have all the predictions across all the test data and you have all the true train, uh, sorry, all the true voxel um, activity uh, 
and we can do a simple Pearson correlation between these two vectors and obtain a similarity uh, measure at the end, so correlation metric for each voxel in the brain. And on the second uh, side here, on the right side, is a 2v2 two, two accuracy, um, which was proposed some time ago. And, and this, this is, is an interesting metric. Um, it was proposed specifically is very, is very good for single trial measurements where you have a lot of noise. Uh, and so the intuition behind this is you have uh, two pairs. So you have uh, the predicted and true activity for uh, two stimuli. And you want to see whether the true activity is matched more closely with its correct match uh, or it's matched more closely with the incorrect match. Uh, so it's a classification accuracy. Um, the, the chance accuracy here is 0.5. Uh, so you, ha you have zero accuracy if a particular stimulus matches with an incorrect true brain activity um, more closely than its own correct activity. Um, or you have an accuracy of one if it matches closer to its own true brain activity. Okay. And so now after we have uh, evaluated these models, we have some kind of similarity measure across the brain for how closely the stimulus representations uh, agree with the actual brain activity. And so now we want to do st statistical significance testing to see whether uh, this estimated similarity uh, can be due to chance or is significant. Uh, and so we have several different hypothesis tests that we can use. A very simple one that makes no assumptions about the underlying data, so no uh, norm, no, no normality assumption or anything like that, is a permutation test. Uh, so I, I think many of you are familiar here, but I will just go through that very quickly. Uh, so this permutation test aims to break the input to output correspondence by permuting the output labels. Uh, so we, basically the whole idea here is that we're going to estimate the similarity, the original similarity, then we're going to permute the output labels and uh, estimate the similarity again and do this thousands of times. And then we're going to see what proportion of times in this permuted labels do we get an equal or greater similarity than the original unpermuted uh, metric. And so this proportion can actually give us the p-value. And this, this is helpful to tell us uh, whether the, this original unpermuted uh, similarity measure uh, is significant or uh, if there's a lot of permuted versions of this data that gives us better correlation values, that means that uh, likely we can obtain the similarity measure that we originally obtained by chance. And when we use this kind of metric for fMRI specifically, we need to account for uh, the fact that uh, fMRI is, uh, again, very slow uh, kind of signal. So when we permute these labels, we want to do them in blocks uh, because we don't want to um, be unfair uh, to, to fMRI. And when we permute just the, the separate labels not in blocks, we can obtain very low values just because we're breaking up this autoregressive structure of the data. So it's important to do it in blocks of uh, several TRs. And of course, at the end, we need to correct for multiple comparisons because, uh, again, we're training very often a model for each voxel in the brain. Uh, there's tens of thousands of voxels. Uh, much of this data is correlated with each other. So uh, when we test a hypothesis like this, uh, there is uh, you know, sometimes 5% chance that we get some kind of, depending on the, the hypothesis test we're using, some chance that we, we could have gotten a false positive uh, just by chance. And so we need to correct for this uh, using standard correction techniques. And so now at the very end, finally, we have our uh, similarity metrics. We know that they're not due to chance, uh, that they're significant. So how do we actually look at our results? Uh, right, so uh, there's a few popular ways to do this. Uh, here I'm just showing a few. So on the left side, uh, we have several different uh, representations that we can use uh, that are typical. Uh, my preferred method is PyCortex. Uh, which is by uh, the Gallant, Jack Gallant lab. Um, and here I even have a, 
citations to it on the left bottom bottom part uh, because it lets you look at your data from different perspectives. Uh, it's very uh, interactive. Uh, you can flatten the map as well. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend this um, way to visualize the data. And on the right side, we have a very standard uh, approach, which is MNE. And there we're able to visualize the sensor time points um, similarity um, in, on, on a helmet plot. And this is good for MEG or EEG. Great. So this was the first part uh, where we discussed the classic findings and these common approaches for how to fit and test encoding models. Uh, so uh, next I'm going to move on to findings that uh, actually utilize deep learning and recent progress in deep learning. But uh, I just want to pause for questions. Hey, um, so regarding evaluation, I noticed, so I'm, I have no neuros, neuroscience background, but I noticed a paper by MIT, I think F. Federico's lab, where they used the noise ceiling to, to evaluate. So I think that is something like how an average human representation can predict other mm -hmm. representations. So yep. how does that compare against the standard evaluation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. I'm actually going to discuss that paper um, in the second part. Uh, but yeah, that, that's one thing, uh, one way to um, basically contextualize the similarity metrics. So the evaluation, the, evalu the evaluation metrics that I discussed are a way to say, is there a significant relationship? Uh, but what you're mentioning now, which is to put the similarity metric in perspective with how much of the variance is explainable, right, is, is a way to say, how well are we doing with these similarity metrics? Can we do better? Can we match this uh, brain data better? Or is there a lot of noise in the data? And then maybe we're actually doing like pretty well. And the point here is that a lot of times the actual accuracy or, accuracy or correlation that we get is around like 0.2 or 0.4. And it's hard to tell is that good? Uh, I mean, it's significant, let's say, but can we do much better than that? And so um, Ev, uh, Martin Shrimp and yeah. uh, the other people on this paper that I also discussed briefly uh, came up with a way to do a noise ceiling and showed that actually we are doing pretty well almost up to noise ceiling for a lot of brain regions when using deep natural language processing models. Yeah, and there's other ways to do noise ceiling as well right. using repetitions of the same stimulus uh, and seeing how repeatable is activity th through the different repetitions of the same stimulus. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. So we'll move on to the second section. <clears throat> and here again, I will discuss these works that actually make use of uh, some progress in deep learning. Um, and I'll split them again into a language, vision, and audio part. And I, I must say that language is uh, my uh, application domain, so I'm most familiar in the work in, in that area, but I wanted to highlight also works uh, in vision and, and in audio. And f because of time constraints, we can only highlight uh, several works, uh, but in our repo, we uh, hope to collect a larger, more comprehensive set of works. So if we do miss something, uh, please, uh, you can ping us on the repo to include it if we have not included it there. Right, so we're going to get started with the language part. So here, uh, what the authors uh, did was they had, so this is work from uh, Leila Webbe uh, from 2014 and colleagues. And so I, I want to note here that this work precedes a lot of progress in natural language processing. Uh, so this is, uh, which happened around 2018, 2019, and, and more recently. So uh, here the authors had uh, the sti a stimulus, which is uh, people reading one chapter of Harry Potter. So this is about 5,000 words during uh, viewing this um, chapter in MEG word by word. And so because this predates a lot of progress in NLP, they actually trained a natural language processing model on their own uh, using uh, Harry Potter fan fiction, which uh, hopefully has similar data statistics to or text statistics to the actual book. Uh, and so uh, they derived these representations from the NLP model that they, train, that, that, that they trained and aligned these representations from different layers of the model to the MEG recordings. 
Uh, and so here I'm showing results for three subjects. Uh, so in, in pink, we see uh, how well a word level embedding from the strain model is able to predict the brain recordings, the image recordings uh, to a specific word. So we can see that, um, you know, this is a single trial. I just want to mention as well. So of course it's, uh, it's noisy. The authors uh, didn't do a noise ceiling uh, here. So we were not sure how much of the variance is explainable. Uh, but this is significant amounts, what the authors are presenting here. And so what they see is that uh, we, this pink line here, so we see a rise in uh, predictability of the MEG recordings, um, and it peaks around four, 400 milliseconds, which we know from the neuroscience li literature is where kind of semantic processing is happening. So between 400 and 600 milliseconds after a word is first presented. So we see that this words align uh, quite, the word embeddings from these models align quite well with the MEG recordings. Another very interesting finding here uh, is this blue line, which is from a contextual representation. So this is an intermediate layer in the model. And what they show is that this intermediate layer can predict the brain activity before onset uh, and, and during the word presentation. And the predictability decreases as the participant starts to integrate the current word into the contextual representation. So this work um, is, at least to my knowledge, the first work that shows the significant alignment between um, these MEG representations and neural network representations of language. So second work uh, that's a bit more recent, but also slightly predates this, uh, this work in, in NLP. Uh, from, so this is from 2018 from uh, Shaley Jane and Alex Huth. So here the participants actually listened to a moth radio hour story. So this is stories from NPR. And they also trained an NLP model uh, to predict upcoming words in using data from other uh, radio stories. So not, not neuroscience data, but the actual uh, transcription of the text that, um, of what is said in these different stories. And the recording modality was, was fMRI here, and the participants listened to this moth radio hour. So what they showed, they, they looked at uh, varying the amount of context they present to uh, this, this train model, and to see how well does uh, this, the representations from this model with different amounts of context predict the fMRI activity. And so they can also look at this for different layers in the model. So the model had three layers. The first one is word level model, which doesn't have any context, so it's just the current word. Uh, then the second layer has, is integrating the, the current word with the previous context. And the last layer uh, is doing the same thing, but a bit more on the higher level. And so what they see is that uh, the actual the middle layer of the model, so the, the, the first intermediate layer of the two, is the one that uh, predicts the brain activity uh, the best, and uh, they all kind of plateau past about 25 words as well. So they also can look at, um, they, they came up with a way to investigate the time scale of different voxels uh, in the fMRI image, and here they're plotting on the bottom um, left and right, they have examples of the, the, time, the time selectivity, time index, um, of two voxels, so one is in, um, one prefers short time scales, the other one long time scales, um, and what they fi find is that the ones that prefer shorter time scales uh, are usually in, in the primary uh, auditory cortices, and the ones that prefer longer time scales are in higher level uh, language cortices. And so, so, right, so here the alignment, they show this alignment between fMRI recordings um, and NLP representations with varying context, and there's best alignment with the middle layers in the models. Uh, so an, another, another work in this direction was from, um, uh, from us, actually. So here, what we investigated was uh, also this amount of context that a model and the brain can represent. Uh, and we looked at specifically two types of regions. Uh, so the regions in white are ones that are known uh, from previous work to be selective to both um, individual words and longer uh, sequences of words. 
and the regions that are in red are known to uh, process um, consecutive, longer consecutive word sequences. So we evaluated uh, different kinds of NLP models, transformer-based, recurrent-based uh, models, and also some that had both transformer uh, and recurrence in the architecture. And what we found was that um, across these models, we looked at uh, different layers and how well they align with the brain as well. And what we found was that these regions in white uh, were, were predicted well by both the word level representations and the contextual representations from the model from middle layers. Uh, and the regions in red, uh, here on the top right, the, those regions in red are predicted best by the contextualized representations from the middle layers. So this aligns with this idea that the red regions are processing contextual information a uh, longer time scale, um, and the white regions are processing both types. And we also saw that uh, if we vary the amount of context we provide to the model, uh, we can see that um, it's a bit of a uh, hard to see here on this very busy graph, uh, but what we see here on the right side is that the model that combines both transformer and recurrence in its architecture is the one that's uh, best able to predict the brain activity as we continue to increase the amount of context that we provide. Uh, so this tells us that this model is able to incorporate more long-term dependencies uh, than these other models because we believe that the brain is able to uh, maintain this context for long periods of time. But NLP models can struggle with that. Right, so across these several types of different architectures, uh, we show this best alignment with fMRI recordings of uh, people reading Harry Potter in the middle layers of the models. And so another work uh, that's uh, more recent um, had participants reading sentences, uh, and they derived different representations from three different types of models. So they had the words, um, a visual representation of a model that's actually trained to um, be able to represent the word, the written form of the word. They had lexical models, which are the word level representations, which don't have any context. And they had the third type, which is a compositional model, which is uh, basically a model that's able to contextualize the meaning with previous uh, words. And they used both fMRI and image recordings uh, of people reading these sentences. So what we found was that the visual representations uh, predicted the visual cortex uh, very well. Uh, the lexical representations predicted a large, um, large number of regions ac across the language network. Uh, so th these are in, in green here, and it's important to note that these results are bilateral. So uh, the so these models are able to predict the activity in both the left and the right hemisphere, though uh, the prediction of the left hemisphere is significantly better than the right, but the right hemisphere is still predicted significantly. And then, and, uh, which I want to say this is a standard result. Uh, we see this all the time with more naturalistic data that both the left and the right hemisphere are very active during the presentation of language, which is different from, as uh, many of you may know, the traditional view of language that the left hemisphere is the one that is processing um, language and is lateralized. And then the last result here is uh, from the compositional model is that the compositional model is able to predict uh, better than the lexical model, many of these regions as well in the language network and outside of the, ling the language network. Um, and they also show, um, uh, one another thing that this work contributed uh, is that they evaluated uh, how well does a model perform at the task that it's supposed to be performing, which is predicting the next word, versus how well does it predict the brain activity. So in other sense, does a better language model uh, is a better language model also a better predictor of the brain? And if that's the case, then that will suggest that perhaps um, the two, the brain and the language model, uh, of course, not conclusive evidence, but it suggests that perhaps they uh, do a similar kind of optimization. So perhaps the brain is also predicting the next word. And they do find, in fact, that a significant correlation between the, the performance at predicting the next word and the activity prediction in MEG and in fMRI. Uh, 
And now uh, this work uh, that was asked about, uh, which was from Martin Schrimpf and, and colleagues. So here they have a uh, large uh, number of models and also different kinds of data sets uh, that varied in the type of modality. So they have fMRI and ECOG. And they also vary the, num the nature of the material. So they have sentences, passages, and short stories here presented. Um, right, and they also have the re uh, reading and the listening modality. Um, so uh, here I just want to mention this is, um, the results are quite similar to the previous results we just saw. So they have a large number of models. Uh, but the, the interesting part here is that they do show that, um, in fact, when you estimate a noise ceiling, uh, so how much of the brain activity is actually predictable, um, many of these models, uh, can, the best of these models, can reach this no noise ceiling in particular areas of the brain. So this is, is very interesting. Uh, it basically tells us that this NLP model can predict a person's brain activity as well as another person's brain activity can predict that person's activity. So that's, it's kind of big. Um, and they also evaluated this ability of the model to uh, predict the next word versus predict the brain, and they found a correspondence as well there. And then one more thing I want to mention here is that they also looked at behavioral uh, metrics. So they looked at reading times, and they showed that the next word prediction performance of the models also is predictive of the reading times of the models. Uh, this is not the first time this is shown, uh, but it's, it's interesting to put in, in perspective with the neuroscience uh, aspect of this, these findings as well. And here uh, I will share just one last uh, work in this area, uh, which is very recent, um, and it, in, it investigates the relationship between representations derived from pre-trained natural language processing models again and ECOG during listening of a naturalistic story. And so here the authors make a very interesting point, and I encourage you to read this paper because it has a lot of different controls that are important that I can't uh, get into right now because of time constraints, but they distill kind of three fundamental computational principles that they claim are shared between the natural language processing model and the brain. And these are that they're both engaged in next word prediction before the onset of a word. Uh, the second one is that uh, there, there are some pre-onset predictions uh, to upcoming words uh, in order to calculate post-onset surprise in both the machine and the brain. And the third one is that they both rely on some contextual embeddings to represent uh, the words in these natural contexts. Okay, so this was the, vision, the language part, and uh, now we have significantly shorter vision and audio parts. How are we doing on time? Okay, <laughs> I'm running a little bit behind, I think. Okay. Great, so one, one work here, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna highlight, let's see, four works. Uh, so one work is a very uh, classic work with deep learning, which is one of the first works that showed this correspondence between layers, intermediate layers of a network and brain uh, image, uh, brain um, recordings. Though this, these recordings were from recordings of macaques during uh, viewing natural object images. So this is from uh, Danny Emmons and colleagues. So very quickly, uh, so they have uh, different convolutional neural networks and uh, I think the most interesting result here is that uh, these, these networks were trained for object recognition, so not to predict brain activity, uh, and yet their output layers uh, predict inferior temporal cortex uh, in the rhesus macaques uh, very well, uh, and this IT is the highest uh, ventral cortical area. Um, and the previous layer in the network also predicts the previous layer in the hierarchy of uh, the ventral cortex, which is V4. So this was a very interesting finding. Um, so they showed that these highest layers in the CNNs uh, are most predictive of uh, IT, whereas the intermediate layers were most predictive of V4. So again, this was kind of the, the uh, standard work that is always cited uh, when we talk about relationships between 
hierarchical uh, CNNs and um, brain representations. So the second work that I wanted to highlight is by uh, Radek Sitchi um, and, and colleagues, and they showed a similar uh, property of CNNs, but with fMRI and image recordings of humans uh, seeing natural objects. So go through this uh, quite quickly. So again, these networks were tuned for object classification. Uh, and they showed a, a similar uh, hierarchy uh, for this object classification to CNNs, uh, which capture stages of human visual processing uh, in both space and time. So they did this both in MEG and fMRI. Uh, and the third work I want to highlight now is very recent uh, from just the last year. Uh, and here they used a new type of model. So, so far we've been talking uh, in, in the vision section we've been talking about models that are tuned to um, object classification. Uh, but that's not a very realistic, um, well, it, it, perhaps it's part of uh, how the brain is also tuned at some point, uh, but it's, it's not realistic that we get all of our supervision in, in this way. Um, and perhaps there's some self-supervision that happens as well, where let's say uh, the brain is trained uh, via prediction of what happens next. Uh, so this is what we call self-supervision, because you don't need an external label uh, to tell you whether something is wrong or right. You just see what happens, and you can update your predictions uh, for the next time. Uh, so uh, this is work by Talia Konkel and um, her colleague. Uh, so here they use a new type of model, the self-supervised model. Uh, and what, what they did was uh, th the way that this framework works. Um, is this is called instance prototype contrastive learning. Uh, and this makes use of a new development in deep learning, which is contrastive, the contrastive learning framework. Uh, and this framework operates in several steps. So the first step is to take these multiple samples of, of the image, which you see in the second part there, um, and project these into a lower dimensional representation uh, via convolutional neural network. <coughs> Uh, and we can then use contrastive learning to, to map these uh, different representations uh, to, the same, uh, to the same image closer together and farther apart from representations of other recently viewed images. So they show that by using the self-supervised uh, trained network, we can achieve parity with some category supervised models in predicting fMRI responses along the visual hierarchy. So these models are as good, at least this work, th this is what this work has shown, that these models are as good as uh, task-based models at predicting the fMRI responses. And then the second work, uh, which is in a similar vein, so they also use self-supervised models and contrastive learning um, here. Uh, but the interesting part that I wanted to share here is that they're actually, uh, what they showed, in addition uh, to what was shown pre previously, is that you can use data from head cams of uh, toddlers, of children, uh, which is very noisy, to train these models. And in doing so, you can still get some uh, brain-like representations in these models that are trained solely with this noisy data uh, from the head-mounted cameras. So I think that's very exciting um, and also a new frontier. Great. Okay. And so uh, I will go on to the audio section now, which is uh, relatively shorter. Uh, so here uh, we have a, a work from a few years ago um, that looked at representations of natural sounds, uh, and they used models that were tuned uh, for classification of speech and music genres. And what they found was that a network that uh, performed best at predicting the fMRI activity to listening of these sounds um, followed some early uh, shared processing between the two, the speech and the music, uh, but then had some, some separate pathways for both. And this potentially replicates uh, human cortical organization. And what they also found was that uh, the primary auditory responses were predicted best by the intermediate layers in these task-optimized models, uh, whereas the non-primary response areas, so the higher level areas, were predicted best by the later layers of the model. And then 
I want to highlight also two works, also very recent from the last few months, uh, which were uh, done using self-supervised speech model. So this is the previous work was with task optimized uh, on for a network that's optimized to do a classification for speech and music, and these are completely self-supervised. Uh, so they learn uh, by predicting uh, what uh, speech sequence should have occurred in some context. And so uh, the authors here evaluate a, a large, um, uh, well, uh, four different self-supervised models. Um, and what they show is that um, you can still predict the brain activity in many different uh, language areas in the brain quite well with these self-supervised models. And they also show this middle layers of the self-supervised models uh, predicting the auditory cortices the best as well. And then one last work uh, in this area, uh, again, using self-supervised model models. Um, I think the interesting part here to point out, there's many interesting part about this work, but I think one addition in this work is that they had models that were trained for three different languages. So English, French, and Mandarin. And they also have speakers of these different languages. So what they showed that the, uh, is that these self-supervised models uh, exhibit some specialization for the native sounds in the superior temporal sulcus and the middle temporal gyrus. Um, whereas uh, the inferior frontal gyrus and the angular gyrus show more general specialization for a speech rather than the native language specifically. So I think that that's also super exciting. Um, great, so that was uh, the end of this uh, recent findings using deep learning. And now we'll move on to the hands uh, on section for the last number of minutes. <laughs> uh, so first I wanna take any questions either in the audience or online. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think there are some questions on the chat online. Um, so one is, uh, so what is the bigger problem? Finding the representation, for example, better deep NN models or finding the mapping between the representation and brain scans? If I understand correctly, the former is the case, meaning finding the representation in your lab models. Yes, I I, uh, I I agree. I think both 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 can be an issue, but the second one is more of a data issue. So if we have enough data, we should be able to estimate this model that links uh, this mapping model between the representation and the brain activity. Uh, and yeah, I, I think the stimulus representation is definitely finding better stimulus representations that capture. Uh, the kind of stimulus properties that we care about, uh, as well as uh, some properties that you know, follow specific hypotheses um, is very important. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, hi. Um, you mentioned that um, models that are better at prediction do a better prediction of the, the fMRI data. Um, and then you made the, the sort of leap saying that maybe the brain is therefore doing that kind of prediction. But models that predict well, that's also a good indicator that they've captured the distributional structure inherent in the language, right? They've learned the relevant constraints on linearization. And might it not be that quality as opposed to the ability to predict, which mm -hmm. is predicting. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, a great point. Um, it's definitely true. I, I would point you to this uh, paper from Ariel Goldstein in Nature Neuro. That's the most recent one uh, that I mentioned. It's uh, here. They do a lot of controls to show the pr that is the prediction part and not the representation of the actual stimulus that's driving this uh, correlation between the two. But I, I agree with you that uh, these two are sometimes difficult to disentangle. Great. So if there are no other questions, uh, we can move on to a hands-on. So uh, would you like to take over? Okay. Joshna, uh, would you like to share your screen, if possible? <laughs> 
Yes, I want to mention that the hands-on portion of this part is relatively, uh, it's much shorter than the previous hands-on. Um, and we expect to, I think the plan is to reconvene at 1.30 after lunch for the decoding part, uh, if you need to go.